I have lived in Kerman for the uh, all but 18 months of my life. 18 months. I was uh, my parents moved to the valley in 1934. My dad, we, I, we, my twin brother and I were born in San Francisco, and uh, my dad was looking for work. My dad came from immigrated from Sweden in 1918, and he. Uh, uh, they landed in Turlock in 1918, and when you talked about the Fresno Scraper, my dad had a Fresno Scraper and a team of mules, and he helped build the Turlock Irrigation District. Oh, uh, wow. For a while, I mean, he didn't. Yeah. Anyway, so at, at then they went to San Francisco, and, and uh, then uh, we came down to the valley. Moved, first, his family had moved to Madera, and we lived in Madera for a couple of months, and then we moved into uh, the Rolinda area, and we lived on the corner of Belmont and Dickinson. It's a almond orchard right now, an old almond orchard, but there was a, a house there. My folks rented it, and they did that. They did that, and I think about I want to say 35 or 36, and uh, then they. Uh, my dad farmed out here on North Avenue. He he broke out of uh, raw ground with a partner, the, the land that Steve Shaw just planted into all the almond trees here in the last couple of years. And so, uh, and that's right across the street from my house. And uh, they came out and uh, they were able to buy the 40 acres right next to that place. And uh, that's the ranch that I live on today. And my son lives on it. It's half almonds and half uh, grapes right now. In two years, it'll be all almonds, so that's kind of where it's at. Uh, we uh, did our, my, my uh, twin brother and I did our first grade year at the old Houghton School in Rolinda, and, uh, and we uh, met a lot of friends there. And then we moved out here, and when we got here, we were in the third grade at the old Floyd School out on the Church and Floyd Avenue. And uh, we did the third, fourth, fifth grade there, and sixth grade, and then uh, then went to Kerman Junior High. Graduated from Kerman High in '51. Uh, went to college at Fresno State for a year, and then went down south for a year uh, at Pasadena Nazarene College. Uh, and uh, I wasn't a very good student. I I just <laughs> didn't like school, so I I corrected that matter. I joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> And when I walked through the gate, I said, ooh, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> anyway, uh, I had uh, three years in Marines, and I s served in Korea. And uh, I, I, I call, call it to be the turning point in my life, because I was a kid that you know, if I didn't like something, I just quit and went someplace else. And when I got there, <laughs> there was no quitting and no going anyplace else. You were there. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I better buckle down. And I was very fortunate because within three years, if you get out of the Marine Corps in three years with PFC and maybe a corporal, you do well. I came out and I was meritoriously promoted to sergeant, so I thought that, hey, I did all right in three years, maybe I can make a go of it. We came out and I uh, went to work with my dad and farmed for a couple of years, and we had some, uh, in 1961 and 62, we had some real heavy winds that spring, and, and uh, two years in in a row, we lost a cotton crop about the 15th of May when it was up like this, fertilized and ready for the first water, and the wind came. And, and uh, in 1962, uh, the, uh, the, uh, we lost it, and I think we made about a half a bale of the acre, and, and uh, that's when the bank said, I think you better find a job. <laughs> anyway, so I did, and I went to work for Wilbur Ellis Company. Salvaged the farm, helped my dad and mom, and I went to everybody that we owed money to. And uh, I didn't get down on my knees, but I was willing to. But anyway, I went to everybody we owed money to, and I said, "If you will not let me go bank, if you won't force me into bankruptcy, I'll pay your bill." Well, how will you pay the bill? And I said, "Well, I'll get a job." Well, what kind of a job are you going to get that's going to pay this bill? And I said, "Well, you know, let me let me go." I said, "I'm a man of faith. I'm a man that." I, I can do it, and if it takes the rest of my life, I won't owe you any money. And uh, we we had, we were farming 100 acres, and my wife and I just buckled down. We said, you know, God, if this is what you want us to do, and you got me something else to do, because I promised myself in high school and college the one thing I would never do would be a salesman.
1962, December, Wilbur Ellis offered me a job as a salesman. <laughs> So don't ever say never. <laughs> anyway, and I became, I don't know, AJ knows about me and some of the other folks. I guess I became a successful salesperson for Wilbur Ellis and uh, worked, the de debts were all paid off in five years. Oh. And, uh, and we had the mortgage on the ranch, but, but the people that we owed money to was paid off in five years. And our, we wanted children real bad and uh, things, uh, you know, and we were active in the community. Uh, and we were uh, doing things uh, that uh, kept us busy, involved. We went to church in Fresno and uh, were involved in things like that. We then, uh, the children weren't coming like we had anticipated and, and we just wondered, my wife one morning she said, uh, or she had been kind of nudging me to, you know, we ought to look into adoption. Oh, I wasn't going to do that. And uh, so she, so I think it was in January of 64. I said, have uh, you have you been considering adoption lately? Whoop, she was up to the phone and called the county office. And, said, <laughs> and we came in and, and the brother all of that was, Tim came in July of uh, 54, uh, 64. He was born on 15th of June and uh, 15th of uh, April. Uh, 54, uh, 64, and he came into our home on the 15th of July, and that was a good move. Very good move. Very proud of that young man. And so then it was in uh, June of 67, we we had to remodel our house, so we converted the garage into a bedroom because the county wouldn't let us adopt a second child unless we had an extra bedroom because we wanted a girl. And uh, so in June of 67. Lisa came to our house, and we're very proud of her too. Very, we got great kids, and I told Joyce it's a good thing we adopted because that's a lot better than we could do. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's kind of where it was. Anyway, <clears throat> and in that time, I, I became very active in the Wilbur Ellis. Became very active in the California Ag Production Consultants. Was a charter member of CAPCA, which is Cal California Agricultural Production Association, and uh, became involved in the Farm Bureau and. Uh, then Tim grew up and what was it, about 71, uh, 1971, he started playing Little League football and, and uh, Lucy Coleman called me one night and, and, uh, and, and uh, she said, you know, you ought to consider announcing the football game because uh, I guess Bob Knowles was doing it and he didn't want to do it anymore and, and I, I can't remember just how it all worked out and I said, well, I'll do it for a night or two and I'll see how it works out. And, uh, so I did it all through Tim's little league years and through his football years in high school and I quit in 1992. So 20 years of announcing Kerman High football. In 1971 I also got elected to the Kerman Floyd School Board, served on the school board and got very involved in that. I, it was in 1946 that you got the picture where my I was 12 years old. My uh, my mom and dad, they said, well, you ought to ride your horse Homer in the Kerman Harvest Festival Parade. And I did. I rode him all the way in from the ranch, rode in the parade, and rode him all the way back. <laughs> so, How old uh, were you then? Huh? How old were you? Twelve. Twelve? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, and uh, that was an interesting story. That horse, uh, in 1944, the Army abandoned the cavalry, and they had a sale of the horses at the fairs and fairgrounds. And my dad went in and bought this horse. It was a cavalry horse, and he was quite a quite a horse. He was a big, tall, sorrel, ball face, a beautiful horse, and fast. He could beat all the horses in the community because we all all the kids out there had horses, and we raced up and down the alfalfa checks and uh, jump fences. He could do that, and I heard my dad had a dairy, and so around us there was nothing else out there, just us, and so we let the cows out in the afternoon to kind of free range cows, you know. That's the story we hear today, anyway. And I, I would uh, herd the cattle in in the evening for milking and things like that. And we did, it was just, I think, 30 cows, so we didn't have that many. But uh, in those days, you did things manually. It wasn't too mechanical. And so we did things like that. Then uh, back to the days of school, I remember we were on the school board and, and we, had a, we had an exciting evening one evening, I don't know if many of you have heard about it, but we had a teacher that, uh, we had a, a, a little Hispanic boy that lived out on California 
and Dickinson, just south, just inside the district, and uh, and he had a hard time doing physical ed, and so uh, the teacher took out his pocket knife like this. He didn't open it, but he took it out like this and held it under his tummy and up and down, up and down. To, and boy, that hit the headlines in the paper and mm -hmm. television cameras. And I was chairman of the board at that time. And we had, over at the junior high, we had a, and I, I thought, boy, this isn't good. So for about three days straight, I was at the county office in Fresno with the county attorney. And this is how I'm going to handle this meeting because we were told from Fresno State that we will have 200 of our students out there at your board meeting on Tuesday night to evaluate how you're going to handle this terrible situation. Well, it was a terrible situation, but it wasn't quite as dramatic as they want to make it sound. Oh, yeah. So anyway, they came out, and uh, I remember our attorney was sitting there, and we called the meeting to order. And I've always been one that, you know, if you can string out a problem a little bit and kind of let everybody cool down. And so when we got in there, uh, I opened the meeting up. I still remember I opened the meeting up. Welcome. We saluted the flag. And I said, well, we have some agenda items to take care of on our, well, what about this item here? And I said, we're going to follow the agenda. So we. And, and of course, then I kind of slowed down a little bit, and we uh, followed the agenda. We had the reading of the minutes, and we called, or we called everybody to order, and we took roll, and we had the reading of the minutes, and we had new business and old business, and just kind of, and they were sitting. I could just see that all this, ready to go. Anyway, Garland Gentry, who was the county uh, council attorney, uh, says uh, he had given me instructions, and so I was following his instructions. And I said, well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a situation here that we're going to deal with right now more than everybody came to attention. And I says, as you know, when you deal with personnel problems, they have to be dealt with in closed session unless that person that the issue is about wants to go public with it. And at this time, he doesn't want to go public. So we'll be moving to the cafeteria, and you can have coffee right here. And, well, no, no, we all want to be in the meeting. I said, well, sure you do, but that's, I'm just following the rules as dictated by the State of California Education Code. And so we went in and push came to shove. We, we had our meeting and we settled it and everybody went home, not very happy. I had one, uh, one big guy, heavy guy uh, came up and uh, kind of pushed me around. And, and I said, you know, you're a big guy, but you touch me one more time and we'll have the Sheriff's Department here to haul you up because you are threatening a public official. Oh, no, no, not me, man, not me. <laughs> anyway, so I've been through the, uh, let's just say, the mill as far as public office, as far as the school board. Uh, then I left Kerman Floyd and went on the high school board, and then uh, A.J. and I were on the high school board together, and then I was the chairman of the high school board when Kerman was unified and brought Sun Empire and Kerman Floyd and, and together. I've uh, been involved in all of the... Kerman, I was uh, charter member, uh, the original only covenant member uh, that brought Kerman Covenant Church to Kerman from Fresno. Uh, my uh, wife and I, we, were, we, we attended in there since we were little children. And uh, they were talking about uh, building a new church in Clovis. And, and I said, well, why do you want to do that? Because I was... Uh, the chair leader in that at that church at that time. I said, "Why well, went, you know, Kerman had a nice community out there. That they'd welcome a new church, and uh, we'd like to see how things would work." And, and so uh, I came out, and uh, or the, the conference superintendent, the director of development, and the treasurer were going to be in Fresno for that meeting on a Sunday evening to meet with the Fresno church at six o'clock. And I knew they'd get there about five, so I got there at five. And I said, before you go to Clovis, I'd like you to go out to Kerman. So they did. They came to Kerman the next morning, and we went to Ma's Cafe. They introduced them to the farmers and, and a few people, and uh, push came to shove. We established a church in Kerman, uh, the Kerman Covenant Church. And so I, right after that happened, I went to G. Nord. The Nord family have been very instrumental in the progress and the success of the church. And I told Gene that uh, Covenant was looking at putting a church. Oh, I don't know. I'm Mennonite. I don't know if that'll work. Anyway, it worked. It all came together. Uh, those are some of the things that happened. Been involved in Rotary till just this past year. I've decided that maybe uh, I did, I'm not very good attendance, and so I've kind of taken a different path. 
I'm retired. You know, I retired in 2000 from Wilbur Ellis after 38 years, and I thought that's that's the end of the line. Well, then I got elected to the Board of Supervisors and spent the last 12 years there till this last year. But there's not going to be any more elected offices. I figure it, at 82 years of age, it's time to do other things a little bit. Uh, this year has not been a very good health year for us because I had a heart attack in April and my wife had been uh, diagnosed with breast cancer in August and had surgery in September or in October before we had surgery and we've gone through that and we're kind of on the other side of that now. She didn't have to take radiation or she didn't have to take chemo so we were very happy for that. Yeah. And we, uh, I just feel being involved in, in a community like this, my knowledge of Kerman when we came here, when we started school here, it was 1,500 people. And the uh, eucalyptus trees went up both sides of Madera Avenue. Klein's cash store was on the corner of Madera and, uh, and uh, 180. Uh, across the street was Harry Schmall's service station. On the other side of the street was Booty Stephan's service station. On this side of the street where the Taco Bell sits, or yeah, Taco Bell, uh, it was uh, a 76 station. On uh, the other side was the Beacon Station, uh, and it was all dirt from there on. There was nothing uh, from uh, Max Hallerman was uh, where the library and the medical center sit now. That was all Max Hallerman's property. I can remember Max Hallerman as a little kid. My dad would go into the meat market to buy meat, and and, uh, and uh, Max was quite a character. He'd, my dad would say, hey, Max, what's the price of beef today? Lots of doink, you buying or selling? <laughs> that, that's, that's where it was. So, uh, But we did that, and uh, uh, I remember doing business with the George Freeze Insurance Company. We were at the Bank of America for many years. I uh, remember when uh, they were talking about uh, consolidating Floyd School and, and uh, the Kerman Grammar School. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, they were even thinking about building a new school out there because they came to my dad and they said, "If we could we buy 20 acres of your ranch to build a new school? And, and uh, then the people, yeah, that's, I can still remember that. And uh, my dad said, well, he said, I don't have a choice. If you want to do it, you'll take it and build it. But anyway, the direction came that the people in the community wanted the school to be in Kerman, which I think was the right thing to do. And uh, that I remember that. I remember also that uh, uh, well, there was just there's so many things that have happened in this town, but the thing that's good about Kerman is that it's a town for the people. Why do I say it that way? I, I can remember when uh, when Joe Fatato got real sick, and I can remember the people just. We took our cotton pickers and everything over there to pick his cotton crop for him to help him. He got no charge, he got it. I remember when, uh, who was the gentleman up north, he fell off a tower or something. Uh, he worked for Cargill at the time, I can't remember the name. But he had 40 acres of vineyard to prune. All the guys out there went out, pruned his vineyard for him. Uh, I remember when Lucy Coleman got cancer real <coughs> serious. We all banded together. and. She went, there was a treatment, a doctor in, I think it was Greece, that everybody felt she should go to, and we banded together and raised enough money to send her over there, along with Sonny going with her. I remember when she passed away, the, the funeral was, you know, it was very sad. But I think the, th the saddest thing was that, and I, I think it's where true love really shows through, is that 52 days later, Sonny passed away, just like that. Lonely, brokenhearted, I mean, so those are the things we've been with. I've been, I was here, uh, I was leading singing in church on, on a Sunday morning when uh, my mom, or my mom, my wife, uh, that flies busy. <laughs> anyway, my wife sent me a little note. Al Horton just got killed. He crashed out here just south of our home. I remember that. And I think, man, I remember at the funeral there. It seems like I've been through a lot of the... The veterans of the community, so to speak, Tommy Kudo, Jim Jerner, uh, so many people that I've been very associated with as part of the community. You got a fly water? Yep. So, uh, been very involved because the community is a community that's for the people, I think, anyway. Uh, I, 
I think that uh, the only person there who gave me a bad time was Bud Ball because I burned off a couple of power poles and Kermit Telephone Company <laughs> said, said I had to put the poles back up. Anyway, we were burning some grass along in and they caught, Bud called me and said, you know what you did? I said, yeah, what did I do? He said, well, you burned off a power pole. I said, well, I didn't. I said, I got away, but I didn't intend to do it. He said, well, I don't care whether you intended to do it or not. You're going to have to put it back. So. And I think it was 50 or 60 bucks. That's about all you charge today, isn't it? <laughs> sure. <laughs> we don't have poles today. Bill. Now it's in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but those things, uh, those are things that we, uh, that we enjoyed. And, you know, it, I don't know if uh, my brother went away to uh, Cal and, and came back and uh, taught school in Fresno. My twin brother taught for two years at Kermit Junior High when it was out at the old uh, campus, mm -hmm. and he, that's a, he came from, he, he went to Cal, he graduated from Cal the year I spent in Korea, and uh, when he came home, he was, he was 20 years old, and he got his first job teaching uh, sixth grade at Carruthers, and he taught there two years, then he came to Kerman and taught junior high for two years, and then after that, he went into the Fresno City system, and then from the Fresno City Unified, he took the job at uh, City College and taught there for 35 years. Became quite a quite a professor, and uh, and we we maintain a, a very close relationship. I guess for the last thirty or forty years, every Saturday morning we kind of sit and talk on the phone for about an hour, and uh, kind of just bring each other up to date on what's happening. Politically, we're about as different as two people can be. I can't help it if he's wrong, but that's the way. <laughs> But if that's the way it is, of course, he would say just the opposite about it. Well, the, the other interesting thing about your family is that you're not the first elected official in Fresno County. Mm -mm. No? My older brother Galen was the county clerk for for uh, oh, for 12 years. Oh, Galen Larson. Yeah, that was my older brother. And uh, so, uh, and then my twin brother's been very active in politics as far as you've seen him on television at night. Oh, yeah that does the analysis on 30 and 47. Yeah. Does mainly on 47 now, I think. Anyway, so we've been we've been involved in so many things, and uh, I, I wasn't born here, but I'm sure I'll die here. <laughs> so that's kind of where it's at, and uh, it's a uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful community that helps people. Uh, and uh, when I was on the Board of Supervisors, I mean, everything that, uh, was within my power to direct this way. I tried, and uh, and they said you're kind of partial to Kermit. I said, Yeah, I am. And I'll admit it. I'm partial to Kermit. So uh, that's kind of where it goes. And I said, I'm partial to Kermit and the West Side. I'm a West Sider. Uh, the West Side uh, brought me out of a tough financial situation and made me really what I am today. And uh, by living in this community, being able to work on the West Side. I've been very proud to be a part of the community, and I'm very proud to be uh, the, the person that, that says that uh, speaks well for the community. I, I, and everybody knows it. And I, they, oh, here comes that guy from Kermit again. I said, yeah. And that's kind of where it's at. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I was a uh, radio operator, uh, and uh, I was an NCO in charge of Jeeps. We would. Uh, maintain communication. I was at the 1st Marine Division headquarters in Korea, and we were online at Panmunjom. Uh, we would maintain communication with the, with the regiments, which would be the 5th Marines, the 7th Marines. And, and uh, my responsibility was uh, deploying those Jeeps every afternoon for radio checks. I can remember taking the radio check up on the DMZ right along the MGM River and driving along now. The war, well, the truce had been signed, but that's still what it is. It's a truce even today, 65 years later. Yeah. But I can still remember it was just a freshly signed then. And I remember driving along that DMC, and, and you'd put your uh, glasses across, and you'd see those big artillery pieces following your Jeep like this. I said, oh, boy, I hope nobody pulls the trigger. <laughs> anyway. So I did that in Korea. I spent two winters in Korea. It was kind of interesting. Right after I got there, a tour in combat zone was nine months. After they signed the truce, they changed the tour to 18 months. So I had the privilege of spending two winters in Korea. <laughs> I can remember coming home and uh, 
and uh, Joyce and I had met before I went overseas when she was in high school and I was a freshman at Fresno State, but then uh, kind of lost communication. And then when we got back, and things kind of, I thought, well, you know, she, I ought to get back in touch with her. I think that would be a good gal to know, and it is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, so I told her after we got engaged and we're going to get married, I said, you know, if you want to go camping, honey, I said, just remember, <clears throat> camping for me is in a very nice motor home or a hotel room. I am not going to go sleep in a tent. <laughs> Never did. I, I had enough tents and foxholes in Korea for two years. I was, Were you in North or South Korea? Well, I was in South Korea. Yeah, no, the truth was science, so we didn't have anybody in North Korea after that. But I was there uh, during Operation Big Switch, which was when we uh, exchanged prisoners. Well, they, we gave back their prisoners, and they gave back the few that they would give back to us. And then I was there during Operation Glory when they brought the uh, war dead back. And they would bring them back at Pan John in a kind of a circled area like this. And they would have a Catholic priest and a Protestant minister and a Jewish rabbi standing there. It's because when they brought them back, they brought them back in, in waterproof bags. And they would just kind of carry them back. And we had to be online with our Jeeps, all polished. And this was in this, in the you know February March when it's wet and cold, and uh, and we'd have to be in spit shine shoes and, and our dungarees had to be starched and pressed. And I thought, boy, what a, what a thing! And we'd stand at attention as we run back. And I can remember the the Koreans in their flappy uniform. They'd come up and stand right in front of you and look at you like this, you know, as the as our uh, Marine color guard would bring the dead back. So yeah, that was as close to combat as I got. But it was close enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, uh, what what all, what do your kids do now? My Tim is the general manager for Holland Nut Company and farming. Okay. And my daughter taught at Goldenrod till this year, and she received a uh, offer from the county, and so she kind of took a promotion, and she is the uh, operate. What is it? An OT specialist. Whatever that means. Anyway, she works for the county, okay. and she comes. She comes back to Kermit, and so she. What she does is she's a special ed teacher, so she handles severely handicapped children. So her job now is she takes care of Kermit, Mendota, Fireball, Tranquility, Kalinga, Selma, and uh, Raisin City. She handles those schools, as, wow. and, and she goes out there. Uh, she doesn't go every day to all the schools, she, but she has. One or two students, in each stu and these are students that can't go to school. She has to do home calls. She has to have special equipment for them and things like that. So she does that now. And she's enjoying it. Good. And I don't know if you remember, but if you think back to 1994, on Mother's Day, the graduation at uh, Fresno Pacific University, it had two women in the picture mastering life together. Uh, when Lisa graduated from Fresno State, she wanted to get her master's and be a special ed teacher like her mom. And so she told Joyce, she says, when I get to the place where you were, we're going to finish our master's degrees together. And uh, Joyce said, well, I don't need a master's degree. I said, well, I think your daughter says you do, so what are you going to do about it? <coughs> so they did it together, and they graduated, and that was on that weekend, and they had a picture of Joyce and Lisa paper yes, on, on Mother's Day, awesome. Mastering Life Together. They got their master's degree together. Well, so. Look awesome. that one up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we got a copy of it at home. If you, uh -huh. But that, uh, and it was a little story. The guy wrote a nice story because Lisa taught at the Kerman High. She was a, a, a special ed teacher at the high school then. Yeah. And uh, Joyce taught at Tranquility, and she was a special ed at tri Tranquility. Wow. And so uh, Joyce coming from the tiger's lair to the lion's den. And <laughs> <laughs> That was really kind of a cute article. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that's pretty good. And mastering life together. Mm. Yeah. I'm very proud of both of them. My wife has been a wonderful, I, you know, uh, I am today probably what my wife made me because she's really, uh, she's kind of the, the brains of our family and the rock that uh, we all lean on. The kids, lean, I can, I, I will call my son Tim on the phone and he'll look at it and say, oh, it's you. Put his phone away. His mom calls him on the phone, he comes right to the house. So. <laughs> <laughs> so.
Well, I guess your brother's not going to be driving you in the parade much anymore. Huh? I don't think I need to be in the parade anymore. No. <laughs> well, I miss I get, all the years I did the parade. You were there. Maybe. Twelve years. Yeah. yeah. Twelve years current at Christmas time and. Uh, that little. And, and his little Beetle. car. He people. he bought that car, primarily, to be a parade car. Really? Yeah. He says, you need a parade car. I'm going to have a Volkswagen convertible. Uh, and he was in the parade every year. Man. I got took a little heat from somebody. Why are you in a Volkswagen? You need to be in a Cadillac. I said, no, nah, I'm a poor man. I'm not a rich man. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of what we did. <clears throat> okay, that's good. that's good. Any other questions? I remember a time, I think my mom asked you to do something for my dad's special birthday grave or quake or something like that when and I remember as a little girl you and the, some church people came over to my mom's house with a casket in the back of a do you know what I'm talking about? Your dad about? turned 40 yeah. Did he turn 40? Okay. Yeah that's what it was yeah it was 40. And then I did the uh, eulogy, eulogy for your dad. Eulogy that's what I remember. At his funeral. <laughs> I, you know I, I've done a lot of eulogies. <clears throat> but, uh, did you head that up or did Gene Nord head that up? What, or did you head that? Up? I did. You didn't. I think it was. Uh, I think it was the gals. I don't know how. Oh, how the guess. girls. Okay. But as far as the uh, eulogy, uh, you, you're, uh, I visited your dad regularly before he passed away. And he told your mom that, uh, that he wanted me to do the eulogy. So I, that was a personal request from him. So. Okay. You know, I. I don't mean to preach, but I just want to tell you something. If you don't think faith isn't important, let me tell you. I can remember when Jim Jerner, how many of you remember the Jerner family? Went to school with Brent. Yeah, and uh, when he uh, contacted Lupus and, uh, and said that uh, the doctor told him you've got two years to live, and he was 36 years old. He was a year older than I was at the time. Wow. And I remember that. I remember I, <coughs> when they decided to take him to UCLA, I crawled in the airplane with Stan Steffen and your dad and we flew him to uh, Santa Monica to the UCLA Medical Center. Then he came home, and he was home in, uh, I guess it was late May or early June. And one night I got home from work, and Joyce said, uh, you need to go over to Turner's because Jim, Elaine's having trouble feeding him, and she wanted to know if you'd help. So I drove over to Elaine at uh, Turner's and walked in, and, and uh, he was, she was trying to feed him, and he, Jim was a big man. He would about 260 pounds. Anyway, I can remember holding his arm, his head in my arms like this and feeding him steak and, and he was saying, that big bear says, I gotta eat. I said, who's the big bear? He says, Oscar, his brother, you know, and he was bigger than Jim. And he, so he says, I gotta eat. So I fed Jim and then he said, well, I'm a little bit sleepy. I, I let, lay my head down. So I laid the head down and we pushed the uh, hospital bed over to the side of the room. I sat and had a cup of coffee with Elaine and this is where the faith part comes in. Uh, walked over to him and Elaine said to me, she said, Phil, would you say a prayer with Jim before you leave? And I said, sure. So I took his hand and took her hand. I said a prayer and he opened his eyes and he said, who's playing the beautiful music? And he closed his eyes and said, yeah. that's, you know, that's, that's walked him to the gate. Yeah. But I mean, and I say that not to preach to you, don't get me wrong, yeah. but it, that's, from the very joyful to the very sorrowful, I've been involved in this community in about every type of situation you can be involved in over the last 75 years. Yeah. I, and I, I'm very proud of the fact that I've been able to do that and very thankful that the community's allowed me to do it. So that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah.